corporations have changed considerably since the 1950s when they were more paternalistic. And employees would start with one company and stay with that company until they retired. Today, technology and innovation has reshaped our world and continues to reshape it almost on a daily basis. This has permitted us to link together in ways that before were unimaginable. Digital communication has become the fastest growing part of household expenditures since 1993. And millions of people all over the world use the internet for everything. So what is globalization? Well, it involves a socioeconomic reform process of eliminating barriers across countries. Barriers to trade, investment, culture, information technology, and politics. For example, let's discuss your genes. Often you'll see genes are made in the USA. But what does this really mean? What part is made in the USA? If you look more closely, you may find that the thread is made in one country, the dye is made in another, the stitching in another, labels, buttons, maybe even in another location. For multinationals, the world is a place where their product can be made anywhere through the global supply chains and often assembled in various countries at different stages. Their world is now so integrated that there is no out and no in anymore. Every product and many services are now imagined, designed, marketed, and built throughout the global supply chain. So globalization leads to increased economic growth, geopolitical integration, and interdependence among nations of the world. What does this mean for you? It means you live in a 24-hour society. You cram a lot more work into a 24-hour period. So why does this happen? Well, because corporations today are working every moment of your 24-hour period. And if you're working in a global environment, it may require you to be up at 3 in the morning in order to get a product out on time or meet a certain deadline. An important area that I'd like to talk to you now is supply chain scandals. As a result of globalization and the expansion overseas, Companies have often learned the hard way how their suppliers' unethical conduct can actually affect their brand. Especially now with the current economic recession, many U.S. multinationals are taking a closer, more in-depth look at their suppliers, and they realize that ethical responsibility is no longer constrained by the four corners of their corporation or by geographical or political borders. As a matter of fact, Supplier-generated scandals are the most significant for these companies and often the least foreseeable. As the complexity of the global supply chain continues to grow, supplier ethics has become a serious and growing concern. Why has this become such a challenge? Well, foreign countries often have different sets of standards with regards to cultural norms, ethics, regulations, environmental rules, and acceptable health and safety regulations. Companies now realize, however, that the entire global supply chain needs to be ethical because consumers, investors, business partners, regulators, and media organizations will keep them accountable. There are several key international institutions that facilitate globalization. Globalization gained momentum, especially after World War II, when the governments of the free world recognized the importance of international cooperation and coordination. At that point, we saw the emergence of three major international organizations, the International Monetary Fund, also known as the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, or WTO. The International Monetary Fund is actually not a bank, but a private club. It's the official lender. It lends to governments, governments that are members of this club. Members that borrow agree to abide by the IMF's constitution. So how much can they borrow? Well, a country can borrow up to 10 times its contribution to the IMF to help pay its bills. The credit line can also address the needs of crisis bystanders during times of heightened regional or global stress. The fund's new short-term lending facilities are designed to prevent crisis from getting out of hand. This fund provides a form of cooperation on international monetary problems. It facilitates sustainable growth of international trade. It promotes exchange rate stability, and it lends countries foreign exchange when needed. 
So let's now discuss the World Bank. The primary role of the World Bank was to aid the reconstruction of Europe after the war. Today, the World Bank focuses on reconstruction and restructuring economies. The World Bank has several affiliated institutions, and it is referred to as the World Bank Group. As a group, they offer loans, advice, and customized resources to more than 100 developing countries and countries in transition. So what is the WTO? The World Trade Organization is the only global international organization that deals with the rules of trade between nations. The WTO is based in Geneva, Switzerland, and currently has about 153 members and an additional 30 countries that are negotiating to join. They assist global trade to flow smoothly, freely, fairly, and predictably by administering trade agreements, acting as a forum for trade negotiations, settling disputes, reviewing national trade policies, assisting developing countries, and cooperating with the IMF and the IBRD. So let's discuss the institutional structure. These institutions play three important roles. They efficiently channel information about market conditions, they define property rights and contracts, and they promote competition and innovation. As we know, the foundations of a globalized world are political. Political institutions and leaders have to be transparent, otherwise social unrest arises. Adaptive institutions strengthen public participation. These are government organizations that create strong incentives or private investment and operate under a system of checks and balances. Investors have greater confidence when conducting business in countries with low crime, effective courts, dependable contract enforcement, and free press. But countries cannot thrive on high-quality institutions alone. They also need effective policies that promote globalization. These include good governance, policy transparency, competent administrators, and consistency over time are measures of effective governance. Countries must also enforce the regulations that promote free markets, such as antitrust laws, national laws aimed at maintaining competition in all sectors of the economy and preventing monopolistic behavior of firms. So in other words, country laws that are not enforced are of no use. Weak physical and intellectual property right protection also discourages domestic and foreign investors from making any long-term commitments. A company must also have strong anti-corruption policies. Illicit dealings undermine the economic performance by raising costs, creating uncertainty, thwarting competition and transparency. Finding solutions depends upon a shared vision by governments, businesses, and non-governmental organizations and society. Corporate social responsibility, CSR practices, are becoming a significant factor in determining where multinationals conduct business rather than foreign direct investment sparking a race to the bottom. Multinationals are looking for long-term commitment to host countries. Globalization winners include the millions that have climbed out of poverty. Many argue that globalization has also promoted civil liberties by proliferating information and increasing choices. The globalization losers, however, need support. Countries that have not been able to seize the opportunities to participate in globalization suffer the most. National policies ought to be implemented to help retain and educate displaced workers. Making globalization work for all. So what should we do to improve outcomes for all? The globalization debate should center on how to best manage the globalization process so the benefits are widely shared and the costs are kept to a minimum.